All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Aviano Baptist. Uh, please stand with us as we begin our worship. But before we begin our worship, I just want to start with the word of prayer real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this time together where we can come and worship you and get to know more about you, Lord, amongst uh, fellow believers. Um, we thank you for just this, the lovely weather we have. Uh, we thank you for the health and the provisions you've given us in our lives. We pray, Lord, that as we worship and as we learn about you, you take away any distraction and that you uh, help us just to focus solely on you, uh, not just while we're in the church service, but also as we go about our daily lives after and for the rest of next week. We pray this in your precious son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. At your name, the mountains shake and crumble. At your name, the oceans roar and tumble. At your name, the angels will bow. The earth will rejoice, your people cry out. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. At your name, the morning breaks in glory. At your name, creation sings your story. At your name, the angels will bow, the earth will rejoice. Your people cry out, Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. There is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing, we will sing. There is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh. We love to shout your name, O oh Lord. Please be seated this morning. Well, thank you, Matt, for opening our time in a word of prayer, blessing and commending our time to the Lord together this morning. Let me just say welcome to Aviano Baptist Church. We're glad you're here this morning. Um, this is the wisest crowd. I said, don't tell the second service that, but this is, this is the wisest crowd because you know this room is just going to get hotter as the day goes on. So this is as cool as it's going to get. We're glad you're here this morning. My name is Barry Cole. I'm the pastor here at Aviano Baptist. And what I want you to know about Aviano Baptist is we are a place where we want to connect you to this church family so that you can grow in your relationship with Christ and ultimately so that he can send you out into Aviano in the world. And no matter where you are in your walk with him, we want to help you do that. We want to meet you where you are and help you do that. And if you're a first-time guest with us this morning, this very special welcome to you. I hope you got a welcome packet. And when you came in this morning, it looks just like this. Um, in this envelope are just flyers about different ministries that we have, different opportunities for you to get connected and for you to grow in your knowledge and relationship with Christ. 
Uh, on the bottom of each of those flyers, there should be some contact information. So if you have questions or you need more information, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to that person. If you can't find a contact information on there or you can't get a hold of them, my email address and phone number at the bottom of the front page of the bulletin. So don't hesitate to reach out and uh, let me know how we can help you get connected. Uh, the other thing I'll ask you to do first time guests is this little flappy, the third flap of the bulletin there that says tell us about yourself. So if you wouldn't mind just taking an opportunity and help us to get to know you a little bit better, there should be a pen in your welcome packet there and just fill that out. It's perforated, so tear, so tear it off and throw it in the offering plate as it goes by a little bit later in the service. And this is for everybody. On the back of that slip, it says prayer requests. And so if there is any way that we can be ministering to you specifically or we can be praying for you, please put that on there. Put your name and stuff on the front so we know who we're praying for. Um, but but please let us know how we can minister to you. Fill that out. You too drop that in the offering plate as it goes by a little bit later. Um, well, let me just draw your attention to a few announcements. Turn to the center back section of the bulletin where it says announcements real big and bold. And let me just tell you about a few things that are going on uh, here in the next coming days and weeks. Um, teen night is coming up on the 23rd. That is today the 21st, Monday, Tuesday. That's Tuesday night. So teen night is coming up on Tuesday night. It's going to meet at Anne Marie Price's house just right down the street here in Aviano. Um, that is for teens age 13 to 18. So if you have teens in that age group, nudge them while you're sitting in the next time if you have teens in that age group or if you know people that have teens in that age group. Anne Marie's contact information is there. The best way to get her is WhatsApp or on Facebook Messenger. But this is a time of fellowship and gathering together, digging into God's word, of course, eating because they're teenagers. But, but Tuesday night at 6 o'clock, I'm not sure the time is in there, Tuesday night at 6 o'clock at Anne Marie Price's house for the teen night. The men's hike is coming up on the 27th. There's still room for guys to be involved in this. This is a guided hike, so we're not going to take you up in the Dolomites and get you lost up there and leave you for dead in the middle of the mountains. So we do have a paid guide that's going to take that group through the Dolomite Mountains. There's a sign-up sheet out on the connection point in the Welcome Center, or you can, you can send a message to Renee Raffamo, our men's ministry coordinator, who's out there greeting. Um, you can send a message to him in our men's ministry WhatsApp group. I mentioned it last week. By the way, we have a men's ministry WhatsApp group. If you're not in it and you want to be, let me know. But you can send a note to him that way and sign up for it. Um, men's ministry is covering the cost for it, so there's no cost. Um, he sent out some information on that WhatsApp group this past week as far as meeting time and place and all that stuff. So, guys, if you got questions, you want to go, grab Brene um, out there in the Welcome Center. Vacation Bible School is coming up next week. Vacation Bible School is coming up, so that's going to be here before we know it. And so if you haven't registered your kids yet, jump online, get on the, on the website, get on the Facebook page. There's a link to do it in both places. Sign up for Vacation Bible School, register your kids. We, all, we will always put folks to work. And so if you haven't signed up to serve yet, but you're going to be available in the mornings next week or you can be available, come talk to me after the service and we'll put you to work. We'll find something for you to do that week. There's going to be 60, 70 kids here every day for the first, you know, for the morning. So we're going to need plenty of crowd control, if nothing else. So um, there's also some things we're looking for, some donations. There's a sign-up sheet out there on the connection point. This is stuff that we cannot buy on the economy. So we have a budget for VBS, and we buy most of our stuff on the economy. We cannot shop. The church cannot shop on base because of the SOFA agreement. So if there's things we can't get, most of it's snacky stuff. Um, if you can sign up and donate that st stuff to us, that would help out tremendously. So see that list out there. If you're a part of the VBS team already, next Sunday after the second service, we're going to get pizza and feed you, and then we're going to set up, and we're going to decorate the church. So if you're part of the VBS team plan on staying next Sunday after the second service so we can get this place decorated and set up for VBS to start on Monday. Questions about that, let me know after the service. And then also in the bulletin there, there's some opportunities to serve. Our prayer team, we have a prayer team. I mentioned the, the prayer requests earlier to put them on that slip. We have a team of people that prays, and we, and we share those requests via a prayer app. And so if you want to be a part of that, the usher ministry, the guys that help us out in the service and help you get find places around the church, um, and also for the greeter team. So we need some, some folks to serve in those ministries. If you're interested in any of that stuff, come talk to me after the service and let me know how we can get you plugged in. We're glad you're here this morning. We're glad to have the opportunity to worship together. And as we continue in our worship time, let's just stand and greet one another in the name of the Lord.
hat on. Please take your seats as we continue to worship. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born, Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of jesus christ oh what a savior isn't he wonderful sing The king above all kings. 
This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. I'm singing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice. Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You Whoa, Jesus, I'm singing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy is His amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I'm singing for all that you've done for me. Please be seated. Ushers, please come forward for the offering. song though darkness fills the night it cannot hide the light whom shall i fear you crush the enemy underneath my feet you are my sword and shield though troubles linger still whom shall i fear I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. 
The God of angel armies is always by my side. My strength is in your name, for you alone can save. You will deliver me, yours is the victory. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always on my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. And nothing formed against me shall stand. You hold the whole world in your hands. I'm holding on to your promises. You are faithful. You are faithful. And nothing formed against me shall stand. You hold the whole world in your hands. I'm holding on to your promises. You are faithful. You are faithful. You are faithful. I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The God of angel armies is always by my side. Well, thank you, praise team. A wife came home one day, and she found her husband stalking around the house like a ninja with a fly swatter. And he had, he had the, the, the battle stance and everything. I mean, the only thing he didn't have was, was face paint. She sees him wandering around the house with this fly swatter, and she said, what in the world are you doing? And he said, well, I'm killing flies, of course. And, and, and he said, in fact, I'm an ace. Five confirmed kills so far. Three males, two females. She said, three males and two females. How in the world do you know the difference? And he said, well, three were on the remote control and two were on the phone. <laughs> I know, that's, that's a bad stereotypical joke. But as, as we talked a few weeks ago in our, in our marriage series, God has created differences in men and women. And he created them very intentionally, very much on purpose, to serve this complementary role between men and women. And sin has come in and has ruined that. It's ruined that, the harmony that God intended between those two. You look around the news today, you read, you know, you watch what's going on online, or you read the, the, just the interaction between men and women in our society, and you see that harmony has been broken down. The harmony that God has created. And sin has come in and ruined the harmony in that relationship. Sin has made men, in some cases, abandon servant leadership altogether. They abandon it in their home. They abandon it in the churches, and sin has crept in and done that. In other cases, it's caused men to use their leadership position, their God-given role in an uncaring and insensitive way. Sin has crept into women. It's distorted their support and, and honor of male leadership, replaced it at times with, with an attitude that can undercut that or challenge even that leadership that God has given to men. And that's certainly what was happening in the church in Ephesus when, when Paul wrote to a young pastor there named Timothy. And that's where we are this morning. So if you've got a Bible with you this morning or you've got a Bible app on your 
device, take it out and open it up and turn to the book of 1 Timothy, Paul's first letter to the pastor there in the church in Ephesus, a man named Timothy. And while you're turning there, let me just kind of give you a little background. Kind of give you a, the, what was going on, set the scene for you a little bit there in Ephesus and, and one of the reasons that Paul wrote. There were a lot of challenges that church was facing, but one of the things was this. There were certain Roman women in the city of Ephesus. They were wealthy women. And so because they had a lot of money, they had a lot of pull in society. They had a lot of influence in and around the town. And so they were, they were used to throwing their weight around. And they very much dressed the part. They wore these expensive, flashy clothes and, and expensive, flashy jewelry and put their, their hair in these, in these very elaborate hairstyles so that everybody around town could look at them and know that they were somebody. Now, if that was just happening in town, that would be one thing. And Paul could say, hey, they listen, that's going on. You pay no attention to what they're doing around town. Here was the problem. Some of those ladies went to the church in Ephesus. Some of those ladies were among this congregation, and they kind of felt like because they had this influence in town, because they, they dressed that way, and, and, and they, everybody knew they were somebody, and because they had that influence in town, that they ought to be able to throw their weight around in the church too. And so they were, they were bringing these attitudes, these defiant attitudes into, a church, into the church in a way that was very much challenging the men who were in leadership positions there in the church. And Paul wrote this letter for a lot of reasons to address other issues than that, but this is one of them. And his comments there in 1 Timothy chapter 2 specifically regarding women and leadership, women and roles in ministry are addressing this particular issue. Now, we're continuing in our Got Questions sermon series, and this is a sermon series. As you remember, I asked you for your questions. You tell me what's on your mind. You tell me the questions that you have, and I'll try to preach on all of those if I can, but most of them. And we're looking at this topic today that is controversial, but it's a necessary thing in our society. It's a necessary thing for us to take a look at this issue, the question of biblical roles for women in the church. Now, you've got your Bibles now open to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Let me just read the two verses we're going to be dealing with this morning, that verses 11 and 12. Two verses, but there's a whole lot to say about them. This is what Paul has to say to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2. You follow along. I'll put it up on the screen to make it easier for you. He said, A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over men, but to remain quiet. And here's the big idea that, that I think that, that the, the, the idea that Paul's trying to push on, present to the church in Ephesus, boy, I couldn't get that out. That's not the hardest part of this, ser this sermon. I couldn't get that out. The, the idea that Paul's trying to present to the, to the church in Ephesus and the, and the takeaway for us, the big idea for us, is that God is honored and the kingdom is advanced when men and women function in the roles that God designed for them. That God designed certain roles for men and certain roles for women. And when we function in those roles, we don't try to fight against them. We don't try to push back against what God has designed. We don't question God's design for things. But when we function in those roles as God designed them, then he is honored and his kingdom is advanced. Now, let me give you a couple of schools of thought on this passage. As we think about how, how Paul wrote this and what he said to the church in Ephesus, there, there are a lot of variations on these themes, but in general, the interpretations fall into one of two baskets. They fall into one of two lines of thought when you look at these verses in 1 Timothy chapter 2. First of all is that it was a cultural thing. Paul was just addressing a local situation there. This was a unique thing that was happening in Ephesus, and it shouldn't be taken to apply to all churches of all times. This was a very, very much a, just a local problem that they were having with these Roman women that came into the church. And it's not just a societal thought that leads to this. This line of thought has been around for some time, and they lean heavily on what Paul says over in the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, he said this, he said, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. And they rely heavily on that. They look at that and they say, listen, the rules have changed here in the New Testament age. In the Old Testament, there were those clear distinctions, no questions asked, but now we're in the New Testament age. And Paul makes this comment, and, and the reasoning is this, is that Paul has, has brought down the barriers of any role distinction between men and women. And they would say, listen, these, this is a cultural thing. 
This is a local, limited thing, and we shouldn't take this as something that we should apply to the church today. So that's one of the schools of thought. This is a very cultural, local problem. The other school of thought, though, is that this is a universal principle to be applied. Yes, Paul was dealing with a local situation. He was talking about something very specific that was happening in that church, but everything he talks about in this letter was something specific happening in that church. Every letter in the New Testament is written to something specific that is happening in that particular church. And Yes, he's dealing with some real issues in that church, but the principles that he lays out are applicable for all churches of all times. Now, here's where I, that's where I fall on this issue, that this is a universal thing that is meant to be applied not just in the first century in the church in Ephesus, but the principles there apply to our church and every church even today. And this is why I fall there. First of all, the wording of the passage favors a universal application. The way Paul addresses women in verse 9 and verses 11 and 12, he doesn't say these women. That these women are dressing inappropriately. He doesn't say just the women who are doing these things should not teach or have authority in the church. The way he addresses women in those verses 9 and 11 and 12, it's, in, it's a general sense. Women in general, I don't allow a woman, any woman to teach or have authority. He, the wording he uses there seems to address all women of all time. Second is his appeal to creation. Verses 13 and 14. He uses as the, as the basis, the support, the rationale for his position, he points back to the moment of creation. And he said, listen, this is the way God created this. Now, if Paul's intent was to just address a local situation, I would have thought he would have gone with a very practical reason, a very practical rationale. Listen, it's pandemonium in the church here in Ephesus. This is why we need to follow this particular order of leadership in the church. But he points to creation. That seems to a point, point to a much larger application. And then lastly, the context favors a universal application. You know, we throw that word around a lot, right? We talk about context of the Scripture. We throw that around a lot. But when we look at context of a passage of Scripture, we look at it in sort of three levels. There's the immediate context of what is said in this particular passage, this particular chapter. What's said before it, what's said immediately after it, how it is said, that immediate context. Then there's the, the context of the entire letter that Paul wrote. How does this fit within everything he said to the church in Ephesus? And then there's the context of the entire New Testament, the entire Bible. And we give special weight then to other things this particular author has said. So how does the context favor a, a universal application here? Well, we talked about the wording. That's the, the immediate context, the wording of this. But then there's the, the context of the book, this entire letter that he wrote to the church in Ephesus. Look over in chapter 3, verse 15. It's probably just one half a page over there. And he gives there in chapter 3, verse 15, he gives his reason for writing the letter. And, and this is what he said. I write to you, so there's no, you know, no, no question about what he's telling. This is my purpose for doing this. I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. He's giving instructions. Everything in this letter are instructions to the church for how they're supposed to organize themselves, how they're supposed to function, how they're supposed to carry out the day-to-day, week-to-week activities of the church. And so if, if his comments are just local here in chapter 2, we can't just cherry pick them out. If his con comments are just local in chapter 2, then his comments in the entire book are just local. And they don't have a universal application. And so I think the context of the book favors universal. And then the context of other things, other things in the New Testament. Paul wrote something similar, almost the exact same words, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 34 and 35. A whole different setting, a whole different community, a whole different set of problems in the Corinthian church, a whole different context and culture, and yet almost exactly the same instructions. And so we look at the context even. I think as we look at this in context, we see that I think that there is a universal application to these. Okay, so that's a lot of sort of academic stuff, pastor seminary kind of stuff, right? But since that's the case... Since these are, there's a universal application to these principles, what are we supposed to do with them? What do they mean? What is Paul talking about when he says this, and how are we supposed to react to it? 
Well, to, to look at that, I want to look at it two ways. I want to look at first, what's the same? in God's order of things in the church. As God has designed and, and put together the church, what's the same for men and women in our relationship with the Lord? In our, and we carry out our worship service. What is the same? And then I want to look at what's different. What's different in the roles between men and women in the church? And then I have a few concluding comments I want to make at the end. So the first thing I want us to look at is this. What's the same for men and women in the church? The first thing is the same as this. And by the way, there is a note-taking guide. If you are interested in taking notes and following along, there's a note-taking guide right there in the center section of your bulletin. So I'll fill in the blanks as we go along, as I do try to do every week. And so if you want to take notes and follow along there in your bulletin, feel free to pull that out and follow along in the note-taking guide. The first thing that's the same is value in God's sight. Look again there at verse 11. He said, a woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. Let me ask you this. What, what stands out to us today in that verse? This audience, audience participation time, you can tell me. What is it that stands out to us in that verse? Quietly submissive, right? Those are the words that reach out the page and, and they grab us. Those are the words that stick out to us. That's not what, what would have caught their eye. In the first century, when Paul wrote this, that's not what would have caught their eye. That's not the part of that verse that would have been the most thing that they would have noticed. You know what they would have noticed? Women receiving instruction. That's what would have stood out. That was radical at that time. That was completely different. That wasn't the cultural norm. Our enlightened 21st century mind said, well, of course women should receive instruction. We pass right over that. But one of the important principles of properly interpreting Scripture is not to find out what it means to me or what it means to a 21st century Western mindset. What did it mean to them? What did the original author intend to say to the original audience and what would have stood out to them was this is different. Women receiving instruction in the church. And here's what he's doing. He's recognizing that women have the same worth to receive God's word as men do. Listen, God didn't have to give us his word. He didn't have to, to reveal not a word of this to us. He didn't have to tell us that we were sinners. He didn't have to tell us that we were destined for hell. He didn't have to tell us that his son came to this world and died on a cross that you and I might be forgiven and spend eternity in heaven with him. He didn't have to do that, but he chose to. He gave us his word as a gift so that we would know that, so that we could come to forgiveness and spend eternity in heaven, be reconciled unto him. He gave it to us as a gift. And Paul is recognizing that, listen, this gift in the eyes of God is available to women just as much as it's available to men. He's raising women up, raising the standard, raising the recognition that they have value and worth in God's eyes. It's the natural consequence of Genesis 127. God created them male and female. In the image of God, he created them. It's a natural consequence of that. Listen, there isn't, God didn't give more of his image to men and less of his image to women. He didn't do it that way. Split it 60-40 or 70-30. He didn't do it that way. God poured his image. Human beings are the image bearers of God in this world. And it's what gives human beings inherent value in this world, inherent value in God's life, in God's eyes. It's not what we, what we do in this world or, or what we achieve or what we might become or whether we are or not a burden on someone else. That's not what gives human beings inherent value. You know what gives human life inherent value? That we are the image bearers of God, both men and women equally image bearers of God. This is a natural consequence of that. And it's the proper interpretation, I think, of Galatians 3.28. I mentioned some look at that and they say, see, God has taken down all the barriers and roles in the church. That's what Galatians 3.28 means. But I think here's the proper interpretation of it. Paul is talking about in Galatians our standing in Christ. That when you and I, have, when you and I trust in Christ, repent of our sins and trust in him, that God no longer sees us as, as sinners, no longer sees us as children of wrath. And you know what he sees us as? His son. The beauty of his son, that's all he sees. And on that day when we stand before God, and he may ask us a question, the old evangelism explosion question, he may ask us a question, why should I let you into heaven? And if our answer is anything other than Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter who we were in this world. 
whether we were Jew or Greek, whether we were slave or free, whether we were male or female, none of that matters. The only thing that will matter is I'm with him. I'm with Jesus. That's the only thing. Our standing is equal in God's eyes in Christ. That's what Galatians 3.28 means. So one of the things that we see is the same for men and women in the church is our inherent value in God's eyes. He doesn't make a distinction to say one is more important or more valuable than the other. The second thing is the need for character development. That's the other thing we see in this passage is the need for character development. Paul is recognizing the importance of godly character and even, yes, women in the church. Now, I mentioned that's kind of a radical thing, first century. First century people would have, would have honed right in on women receiving instruction. Most rabbis in the first century were indifferent to whether women received Bible instruction or not, whether they came to the synagogue service or not. Now, there were a few on the fringe. A few had more, more of a radical approach, and they took the approach that it's, it's better to burn the Torah than to teach it to a woman. Some had that approach. Most did not. Most were of the mindset that I don't care if they come to synagogue or not. If they show up, fine, whatever. If they don't, fine, whatever. There was no, no intentionality, no specific desire to teach women the Word of God. That's where most rabbis were. And then comes along this rabbi named Jesus, and he taught women right alongside men. He engaged them. He asked them questions. He included them in the discussion. He gave them meaningful tasks to do. And then comes along this rabbi named Paul, and he, and he says this, that a woman must receive instruction. And then, by the way, here's how she must receive it. Those were radical thoughts in those days. It's the same thing, though. It's a consistent message throughout the New Testament. He says over in chapter 4, verses 7 and 8 of this book, he said, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. And then Peter said this in his second epistle, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. He said, we collectively, all of us, have been given all we need for godliness. And then he said this a little bit later in that book, ch chapter 3, verse 18, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And listen, those things, those, those passages, those instructions about our need for character development are the same for men as they are for women. There's no distinction there. There is a need for godly character, and he's pointing that out here in this, in this passage. Now, in order for character to develop, character development to happen, we need a teachable spirit. And that's what he means by quietly, that a woman ought to quietly receive instruction. He's talking about a teachable spirit, but by the way, it's not just women that he's addressing in this entire passage. If you've got a King James that said a woman must receive instruction silently, and I think the Holman Christian Standard says the same thing. But it doesn't mean that, ladies, you need to zip your lip as soon as you come into the church. Can't say anything while you're here. See, see, when you're out greeting, you can, only, you can only nod and smile. Can't say anything, just got to nod and smile. If you're upstairs, ladies, in the children's ministry, everything's got to be done in pantomime up there. You can't say a word. That's not at all what he's talking about when he says quietly or even silent in the King James. It's the same word he uses back in verse 2. He's talking about the believers leading a tranquil and quiet life. Now, he's not calling for a vow of silence on the part of believers. The word means serene. It means peaceful. It means content. And in essence, in this passage, it means teachable. That's what he's talking about, that when women come into the church, they need to have a teachable spirit. Now, he's not just talking about women. It's not just women that need to have a teachable spirit. He's also talking about the need for that in men. And how do, why do I say that? Because that's the other thing that's the same for men and women in the church, that our walk match our talk. That, that what we say we believe, how we conduct ourselves as believers, the, the need for those who, who say they have godliness he's talking about here. The way we live our lives as believers needs to match what we say we believe. These ladies in the church, they, they were not, they, when they went out, they would come to church on Sunday morning. And they would praise God, and they may, might raise their hands. I'm not really sure what the service would look like. I've never seen, never seen a first century Jewish or a Christian service. They might have raised their hands a little bit. Uh, they, they might have said amen when the, when the preacher preached. They might have said those things in the service on Sunday. Boy, they looked all godly, right? And then you see them the rest of the week. They look nothing like that. They look just like everybody else, and there is a need for both men and women for our walk to match our talk. Look back up there at verse number 8. 
Therefore, I want men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. He's saying men, prayer and worship, those, some of those key aspects of our Christian walk, I want you in every place, everywhere to do those genuinely. Worship in spirit and truth. That's the way Jesus said it. And then, he, and then he goes on, not just the men, same requirement for the women, verses 9 and 10. I want the women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly, discreetly, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly garments, but by means of good works as is proper for women making a claim to godliness. Now, he's not after a dress code here. That's not what he's, what he's talking about. Some, some of the more legalistic groups would take this as very much as a dress code. He's not talking about a dress code. That's not where he's going with this. He's talking about the need that what we do on the outside matches what we believe on the inside. Jesus said it this way in Luke chapter 6, verse 45. He said, what comes, a paraphrase, what comes out is what's stored in the heart. Listen, if throughout the course of your life, this is what was happening with these women. Throughout the course of your life, as you go about your day-to-day -day activities, if your life looks exactly like every unbeliever around you, then you have to ask yourself, what is in my heart? What is in my heart? Because what comes out in my life is going to come from the depths of my heart. And if my life looks like every other unbeliever, then I've got to ask myself that question. What is it really that is in my heart? And then Paul said this, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, his first letter to the church in Ephesus. By the way, a little Bible trivia fact, the church in Ephesus received more attention than any other church in the New Testament. Four letters written to the church in Ephesus. The book of Ephesians, 1 and 2 Timothy, and then Jesus wrote a letter to the church in Ephesus in the book of the Revelation. A little Bible trivia for you. But Paul wrote this in Ephesians 4, 1, said the same thing in Colossians 1, 10, that we ought to walk in a manner worthy of of our calling. That's the same for men or for women, that what is on the outside needs to match what is on the inside. A lot of things that he, that he mentions in this passage that are the same requirements for men and women in the conduct of our Christian life. It has, it has nothing to do with how we go about our Christian life. What is different, though? We talk about the roles of women in the church. What is different between men and women? That's the other thing I want us to look at. We saw what's the same important aspects of our Christian life, but what's different for men and women? First thing is there are different roles to fill. Different roles that God has for men and for women to fill. Then again in verse 12. I do not allow a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. Now, clearly, now he's talking about roles, right? I do not allow women to do certain things, fill certain roles within the church. Now, as we just saw, that doesn't imply inferiority in any way. That doesn't imply that, that women are lesser value. See, that's where society attacks this. That's where society looks at this. They say, that's misogynistic. That's just saying that women are second-class citizens, that women are of no value, lesser value in the church. But not in God's eyes, they're not. Not in God's economy, women are not. This doesn't imply inferiority. It doesn't imply that women are in, are in any way not as valuable as men, have a less worth. And it isn't the result of sin. I mean, we'll look at Genesis. We think about Genesis 3.16. And there's a curse that came there in Genesis 3.16. And God said to Eve that you will have desire for your husband and he will rule over you. But all of this came, this, this godly role, this, this function within the church, these different roles came before the fall. It came before the fall. It's not the result of sin. We shouldn't look at those different roles and say that's just a, that's a consequence of the sin. It isn't. It's the way God designed things in the moment of creation. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 20. You can just circle that in your note-taking, God. We're not going to turn back there and look at it. But in Genesis chapter 2, God speaking to Adam, and he lays out some responsibilities for Adam. He said, here's the garden, Adam. Take care of it. All of my creation, take care of it. Be the steward of my creation. And then he says, here's what you can and cannot do. He may, in essence, he delegates to Adam the, the, the responsibility, the authority of being God's spokesman for what we can and cannot do. And then he says, Adam, Adam here, you name all of the animals. Gives him authority over all of the animals. And then he creates Eve as his helpmate, as his co-laborer. That's what that word helpmate means. 
He created these in this order within creation, and then God declares it all very good. You see, these specific roles that we have within the spiritual realm, within the house of God, they're not as a result of sin. It's not something that God said, well, fine. If you're going to disobey me, then this is the way things are going to be set up. They were part of his perfect design. They are good. He declared them to be very good. Different roles to fill. And one of those roles deals somehow with the issue, the aspect of teaching. He mentions that the first part of verse 12, that I do not allow a woman to teach. Now, let me say this. He is not ruling out teaching in every and all circumstance. Over in Titus chapter 2, he talks about older or more mature women teaching younger women. He's not ruling that out. In, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he, he commends the way Timothy came to know the faith. Because through his mother and through his grandmother. So teaching young people. He's not ruling that out. Acts chapter 18. We're introduced to a, a woman and her husband. Priscilla and a man named Aquila. As they pulled a man named Apollos aside. And they taught him the scripture. And Apollos then went on to be the pastor of the church in Corinth. And Paul commends him in his work there. Paul's not ruling out any and all teaching by a woman. But there's a link here in verse 12 to authority to the exercise of authority within the church. He said, I don't allow a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. And so the teaching he's talking about is the kind that somehow, exer somehow links to the exercise of authority in the church. And so that brings us to the, the other difference. There we go, relates to authority. That's the word that goes in that blank. That brings us to the other difference between men and women in the church. And that is, what does that mean? The exercise of authority. What is that supposed to look like? Because that's got a key link to this teaching piece. What is it that he's talking about there when he talks about authority? Flip over for a minute to chapter 5 of 1 Timothy. Chapter 5, verse 17. Paul is talking there in chapter 5 and verse 17. And he's talking about elders. Now, this is another sermon maybe for another time. But I believe that when he's talking about elders in the church, he's talking about the pastor. I don't believe there's a separate office of elder, and I, we could go into that at a different time, a different discussion. Um, that word that is translated elder and the word that is translated overseer that we often think of pastor are used at times interchangeably in the New Testament. So when I read 517, I read this, he's talking to pastors. Pastors who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. And what he's done there is he's linked the idea of authority in the pastoral role to the, to the act of teaching and preaching. How is it that pastors primarily exercise authority in the church through the teaching of God's word? See, that's different than, than how sometimes authority is, is, is exercised. In the military, authority is mostly position power. Right? That's where you get your source of authority in the military. That's where you get your source of, of the ability to carry anything out in the military is because of your rank, because of your position. Now, you might be very skilled at doing that, and you don't rely on that very often, but at the end of the day, that's where your authority comes from in uniform, because of your position power. It's not so in servant leadership. It's not so in pastoral leadership. I don't, I don't exercise leadership in this church because of my position. The way I exercise it is through the teaching and preaching of God's word and encouraging the church to follow that. It's very much a, a persuasion. And, and a teaching and authority are the two key aspects of pastoral leadership. They go together and they can't be separated. And all of this, he says, is on the shoulders of men. The, the exercise of pastoral authority in the church through teaching, this act right here of preaching God's word, all of that authority falls on the shoulders of men. And as his basis for that, he points back to creation. Look there, verse 13. For it was Adam who was created first, and then Eve. And we talked about that. There is, there is a priority in the order that men and women were created in. God created Adam first. He gave him all the responsibility. Then he created Eve as his co-laborer in that. There's a priority in that order. And he points back to that and says, this is the reason for that. Not because men are smarter. Not because men are more talented. Not because women can't hack it. But because that's the way God designed it. And then he talks about the fall 
verse 14. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman, being deceived, fell into transgression. Now, let me just say something about this verse. Stop here for just a minute and say something about this verse. Because you might be thinking, didn't you just contradict yourself, Pastor? You just said it's not because women can't handle the burden of leadership. And then we come to verse 14. What is he talking about there in verse 14? A lot of people view verse 14 exactly that way. And they say, listen, women are too easily deceived. Women are, are too easily led astray. That's why God didn't give them the, the ability to teach with authority, the ability to carry out the pastoral role. That's why, because they're too easily deceived. But I don't think that at all that's what he's saying. I realize how arrogant that sounds. Many people believe it this way, but I think they're all wrong. I realize how arrogant that sounds, but I do think they're all wrong. I don't think that's at all what, what Paul is saying there. I think his point is this. There are consequences when God's design for spiritual leadership are abandoned. There are grave consequences when God's design for spiritual leadership is abandoned. We think about the fall. He takes us there, verse 14. So we think about the fall of man back in Genesis chapter 3. And there's something interesting that happens if you've ever read that account. You come to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6, and Eve takes of the fruit. She sees it's good. She takes of the fruit. And do you remember what happens at that point? She hands it to her husband, who we're told is with her. See, here's the problem. Adam was standing there the entire time. We get that impression. That this whole conversation that happens between Eve and Satan, Adam is standing there stone silent. He doesn't step forward and say, hey, Satan, listen, that's not what God said. He doesn't turn to his wife and say, no, remember, that's not what God said to you. Adam doesn't take the spiritual leadership role. He stands in the background and, in essence, pushes his wife to the wolves. He abdicates his spiritual leadership role, and he puts Eve in a role that she was not designed to fill. And we get, a, we get a sort of an affirmation of that. Down in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, God is talking to Adam. He's getting ready to lay out Adam's punishment. And he says this, Adam, because you listened to your wife and ate of the fruit, here's going to be your punishment. Now, guys, let me tell you this. Do not go home this afternoon and say, I don't have to listen to my wife. The Bible says I don't have to listen to my wife, and God will reprimand me if I do. If you go home and say that, I've got room in my calendar for marriage counseling. You may need that after you make that statement. But that's not what he's saying. Don't ever listen to your wife. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, Adam, the chain of command, so to speak, was supposed to look like this. You follow my leadership. Eve follows yours in spiritual matters. And what you have done, Adam, is you have reversed that order. And there are grave consequences. I think that's his point back here in 1 Timothy, that there are consequences that the likelihood of sin and error is much greater when we forsake God's intended order for leadership. That's why all of the qualifications. As, as we move into chapter 3, verses 1 through 13, all of the qualifications for spiritual leadership in the church, for the office of pastor, for the office of deacon, all of those are aimed at men. That's why. Not because men are better suited, not because men are less gullible than women, not because women are more likely to be deceived or led into sin than men. We all know that's not true, but because there are grave consequences when we, when we step away from God's intended order of leadership. And that's what I think he's saying. I think the one thing that is clear, chapter 2, he's addressing solely, I believe, the office of pastor. Are there limitations on the roles that women can fill in the church? Yes, specifically in, past, in, in chapter 2, he's addressing that the role of pastor is only for men. And then he expands it as he moves into chapter 3 and says the role of deacon is also likewise only for men. Now that answers one key question, right? Are there specific roles that within the church leadership that women are not supposed to be filling? Yes, the role of pastor and the role of deacon. It answers that one key question, but what about other biblical teaching, right? He talks about teaching with authority. Are there other kinds of biblical teaching that might fall under the same prohibition? What about Sunday school? Could, could a woman teach a co-ed Sunday school class? What about that? What about if a husband and wife are leading a home group and he gets called into work on home group night? That's happened. It's very likely to happen in our church. What's supposed to happen then? Wife, can you lead the home group that night? Is that okay? Is that stepping outside 
of the role? What about somebody like Kay Arthur? Kay Arthur is a fantastic Bible teacher and son. She holds these seminars, these Bible seminars. They're just amazing. Sometimes guys go to those. What about a guy who cues up a Kay Arthur video on Right Now Media? Is that wrong? Should he not be under her teaching because he's a woman? What about Kay Arthur? What about other teaching opportunities? This answer is one question, but it, it begs some others, does it not? And so I want to, I want to, because that's the question we're asking, right? Where's the line? Where's the line? How far is too far when it comes to this issue of, of a woman taking some of these other teaching roles in a co-ed environment? How far is too far? Where's the line? And I think the problem is we're asking and we're trying to answer the wrong question. See, we're asking, where's the line? How far is too far? And I don't want you to think I mean that in a negative sense. I don't mean to imply that there are some ladies who want to just dance right up to the line. Boy, I want to get as close as I can to the line without crossing it. Tell me where the line is so I can come right up to it. I don't mean it in a negative sense. There are ladies even in our church, godly women who have the gift of teaching who genuinely want to get this right. And there are husbands. I got a call from a husband one time. Him and his wife led a home group. He got called into work. That afternoon he called me. What am I supposed to do? Can my wife lead the home group tonight? There are godly people who genuinely want to know where's the line. I want to do this right. But I think the problem is we're asking the wrong question. We're asking and we're trying to answer the wrong question and asking where's the line. Here's the right question. Am I honoring God's design of male leadership? That, I think, is the right question. In the decision that I'm about to make, in the role I'm about to fill, in the teaching I'm about to do or I'm about to allow my wife to do, are we honoring God's design of male leadership? Now, I think that's the right question. Now, I'm going to give you a few things to consider as you, as you kind of work through that. There will be times when you may have to work through this question. I'll give you a couple things to consider. And I'm indebted to a lady named Mary Kassain for these thoughts. Mary Kassain is a professor of women's studies at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, but she's also a staff writer for John Piper's ministry, DesiringGod.org. And she wrote an article on this called, How Far is Too Far? And I've got the link for that there in your notes. If you want to go back, research it later, read the entire article and, and get a little more in depth. But I'm going to give you eight things to look at. I'm not going to go into detail. I know you're looking at your watch and you're thinking, dude, you've been going for a while now. Eight things? When we were in the States, we visited a church one Sunday. Dude preached an hour and a half. The sermon was an hour and a half. Now, having said that, I believe you all have it pretty good. So, so I will not preach an hour and a half. I will not, an hour into the sermon, he said he's going to talk about five elements of church discipline. And then he proceeded to go through every one of them in great detail. So, if my sermon, like it did this morning, bleeds over into 35 or 40 minutes, I don't want to hear any complaints. It could be an hour and a half. I want to hit eight points, but I'm not going to go into detail. I'm just going to hit them quick. You want to know more, check out that article, read some more. Here are some things to consider to answer the right question. Am I honoring God's design for male leadership? Here they are, context, 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 context. The context of the meeting that you're in. Is this meeting church or is it not church? What is the context of the meeting that you are in? What is the nature of the teaching? Is this some doctrinal truth that I'm fixing to lay down or is it some other kind of teaching? Is it more inspirational? Is it more testimonial? What kind of teaching? What is the nature of it? The authority. In my teaching this, am I laying down the, the beliefs of this community? Am I defining the beliefs of this community or am I, am I building off of something that has already been talked about? What is the authority in that moment? What is the relationship with the audience? Is this a mentorship role that you're trying to take with these groups? What's the relationship that you have with this audience? Are you connected to some formal way to them in the community? What is their commitment? Do they have a formal commitment to this group, to this community? Or is it more of an informal gathering, seminar kind of thing or something like that? Do, what, is the, what is the nature of their commitment? What is their obligation to obey? Could church discipline be brought in their lives if they disregard everything you say? 
Do they have any kind of obligation to follow the things that you say in this? Are they, are they in some way obligated like they would be in a church setting to, where we have a scripture that says submit to the church leaders? Or is there an obligation on their part to obey? The constancy of this is our frequency. Is this something that happens all the time or if this, is this a once in a while role that you're going to step into? And then the maturity, both theirs and yours. Are you speaking to them as a mother giving instruction or are you speaking to them as a sister encouraging a brother? And so there's, there's things that we have to consider. It's not an easy black and white thing. We can't just hand down a black and white mandate and say, under no circumstances should a woman ever teach a co-ed group. I don't think that fits with the overall tenor of the New Testament. Jesus didn't, didn't seem to look at women that way, that there were no circumstances where they could interact in any group with a man with men. Paul didn't seem to, to approach women that way. And so I think there's, there's these questions that we have to ask. We have to look at those and say, what is, am I honoring God's design of male leadership? And let me work through these questions to decide that. See, here's the bottom line, and I'll end with this. Oh, here's the recommended resource. It's in your notes, so you don't have to write it down, but there it is if you want to look it up. The webpage and the specific link for that article, uh, Teaching Men How Far Is Too Far. Here's the bottom line, and let me end with this. We often focus on the one or two areas where women are not permitted to serve within the church, and that's the thing that dominates our thinking very often. But here's, here's the bottom line, that God's design for men and women is good. It becomes problematic in our lives when we push back against that. It stirs up anger. It stirs up contention in our heart when we push back against that. In fact, John Piper said this. He said, here's the test of whether you know whether you're okay with God's teaching on this or not. The test is whether this passage offends you or not. If this passage offends you, then you have to say, I've got a problem with God's teaching here. I need to bring that back to him. I need to lay that before him and let him deal with it. God's design for men and women is good. It becomes problematic when we push back against it. And for those who desire to be useful to God, you will always find a place to serve. There is always an opportunity to serve, to heal broken lives, to save souls, to meet needs. If your desire is to honestly and genuinely serve God, the opportunities are absolutely endless. So I'm going to ask the praise team to come on back up. We're going to sing our final song. I ask you to, sing, to stand and sing here in just a moment. And then after the service, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond or, or come and ask questions or, or to pray together with me. But would you stand with us as we sing our closing song? There is love that came for us, humble to a sinner's cross. You broke my shame and sinfulness, you rose again, victorious. Faithfulness, none can deny, through the storm and through the fire, there is truth that sets me free, Jesus Christ who lives in me. You are stronger, you are stronger, sin is broken. You have saved me, it is written, Christ is risen, Jesus you are Lord of all. No beginning and no end, you're my hope and my defense. You came to seek and save the lost. You paid it all upon the cross. You are stronger, you are stronger. 
sin is broken, you have saved me. It is written, Christ is risen, Jesus, you are Lord of all. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. You are stronger. You are stronger, sin is broken, you have saved me. It is risen, Christ is risen, Jesus, you are Lord of all. You, you are stronger, you are stronger, sin is broken, you have saved me. It is written, Christ is risen. Jesus, you are Lord of all. I'm going to be available after the service. If there's something you need to discuss or you've got questions about your relationship with the Lord and how you can know that you're forgiven, how you can know you'll spend eternity in heaven with him, or you need someone to pray with you or encourage you, I'll be right down here for a few minutes after the service. Don't hesitate to come down. Let me know how I can pray with you. On your way out, don't forget, teen night's coming up this week. Men's hike, sign-up sheet out there on the connection point. There's Renee. Wave to us, Renee, so they can see her. If you have questions, see Renee, um, men's hike coming up. VBS, all the sign-up sheets out there. I um, mean, just remember, VBS team members will be doing a setup next Sunday. So if you're part of the VBS team, make plans to stay after the second service next week. Let's dismiss our time in prayer this morning. Father, thank you once again for your love and your grace for the opportunity for us to come together, open up your word and read what it has to say about this important topic for our day and age. How can we honor your design of male leadership in the church and in the home? Father, thank you because your design is good. Your roles for us are good. Help us to find them and to serve effectively in them so that we can advance your kingdom and we can honor you. We pray it in Jesus' name.